Friday Night Racing on Off The Ball Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie And you're very welcome along to this week's edition of Friday Night Racing uh, Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland Love every racing moment Visit hri.ie With Frankie de Tory last week We're topping it this week Because I'm delighted to say Aidan O'Brien is our guest Aidan, good afternoon to you How are you? Good afternoon, good thanks, how are you? Yeah, look, we're we're excited about the uh, pre lock tree of this weekend. You must be particularly excited about it, given the quality of the field and the quality of your entries. Yeah, no, uh, looking forward to it. Um, obviously, we've three runners, so I'm hoping that they run well. When you supplement the horse, what goes into the decision-making process around that? I, I suppose you have to hope that the horse is working well and uh, and uh, you're happy get, that conditions are going to suit. Um uh, obviously, it's it's a lot of money for for us Sunday's race, but um, yeah, no, it's I, I suppose all the usual things really. In terms of um, your one, two, three in the race, Aidan, that time, where would that rank uh, in terms of your 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 proudest days as a trainer? Um, I should listen. Obviously, it was a massive uh, um, day, Johnny. Yeah, um, for it to happen is something you couldn't believe. To win the race alone is is incredibly tough, and uh, you don't ever. Uh, believe or think it could happen but to have the one two three was I suppose like uh, unbelievable really it was it was interesting reading Richie Forrestal in the in in the racing post this week just that even even people maybe the national hunt aficionados I think the, the world just stops for this race uh, whether you're even the hardcore jumps fan um, can't take his or her eyes off the arc and it is kind of that type of race we're just infatuated by it yeah, no, I suppose it's it's um it's kind of art weekend and and everyone wants to be in Paris that weekend. It's a it's a massive race. It's a beautiful facility, uh, very competitive. Um, and I I suppose it's like what you said. It captures everybody's imagination in in the autumn, really. That yeah, I remember when I was a few years ago. I was uh, my flight was delayed for a day in Paris, and I I texted you and explained it, and you said, well, you certainly could be stuck in worse places than Paris for twenty four hours. So you obviously liked the place. Oh, sure, listen, it, it's it's obviously a la mystique uh, Paris has and, and for everybody and, and uh listen it, it's like I said it's a great weekend and to be able to spend a weekend there is is um always lovely really. You're from GA country and when we were kids growing up, this time of the year was when the Ireland finals would have been played. Obviously a little bit later, if there was replays it would kind of perhaps occasionally stretch into October. It strikes me that the the arc weekend and the arc itself it kind of there's a bang of all Ireland final off it because it's essentially the end of the European flat season. The weather is a bit cooler. Everybody knows everything. Everybody is completely exposed. And on the day, we get to find out what we think is the best middle distance horse for that year. Is that fair enough? Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, yeah, no, exactly. They're all there. Three-year-olds, four-year-olds, Phillies, Colts. Um, um, anybody that thinks that they can have a shot over a mile and a quarter plus um, and, and has the class to be in the race, I think it's it's... It's very fair, really. Uh, it's horses are usually after having a, a long season up to then, and and it's kind of whoever is left standing. Then, uh, if and if anybody thinks to have a chance, they this exactly where they want to be. But it's it's very competitive. You need a lot of class. You need to stay. You need to have tactical speed. Uh, everything has to go well for you in the race. Um, you need a draw, and there's an awful lot of ducks have to come in, into a row for you on the day for it to happen. But um, it, it's it's a very special race, really. Do you know at the start of every year which horses you think are going to be our courses and try and work back what the schedule will be, or is it kind of they emerge over the course of the season? Yeah, I, I think so. Like maybe um, with the older horses you have an idea because because you've seen them through their three-year-old career. But like obviously with the three-year-olds, they um, you can get a lot of progression from the start of their three-year-old career to the to the end of it, um, and and horses can surprise you, and and uh, horses can come out of the blue, and and it can happen. But um, Usually, kind of halfway through the season, you have a fair idea of the horse that you would like to have to take part in the race if, if they're in, in good shape come that time of the year. And Snowfall is a great example of that, Ger, because uh, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a horse uh, progress from two to three uh, as she has, Aidan. I mean, when she won her, when she won at the Curra, um, I was kind of half following her because I love Deep Impact. She finished fourth, fifth, ninth, and eighth, and she was 50 to one behind Pretty Gorgeous um, in the middle park, which would have been the, the end of her campaign. Um, and I suppose a lot of people wouldn't have had her, uh, or in the Phillies Mile, rather, at the end of her campaign. Look at her progression this year. I, I, I don't know, have you ever seen Anthony? like it 
Yeah, no, she listen, she's she's from a great middle distance pedigree and she's obviously by deep impact and she always showed a lot of class last year. So you were always hoping that she would come back. I suppose lots of circumstances stopped her from being a very good last year or coming to show how good she was on the track and she had a few hard luck stories in races and she needed to uh, be given a little bit of time for her mind to be let develop and, and uh, I suppose that's what we did really we just took her gently and uh, we treated every race as a kind of a stepping stone rather than a, a win at all cost race if, if you know what I mean um, um, uh, I suppose really it, it was funny the day that um, the day that she was to run in the Oaks uh, I got a call from RTE that there was a podcast the BBC were doing about Shergar which was narrated by Vanilla Ice of all people, um, but it it is I had to talk about it and I hadn't listened to it, so I, I look back on Shergar's Derby performance about half an hour um, before the 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 Oaks. So I just had to stop uh, my my study or whatever to look at the Oaks and her performance that day. She won by sixteen lengths. Was was almost Shergar esque. Frankie Dottori rode her that day. I remember there was a bit of ease in the ground, but one of the most extraordinary visual performances Aiden you'll ever see. Yeah, it, it probably was. Like, it was incredible, really. Uh, I remember Frankie was so taken uh, by her after the race. And listen, she said, well, we were very worried about the ground. Um, uh, like, obviously, she was a deep impact uh, filly out of a Galileo mare. So would suggest that nice ground would be what she'd love. But she obviously um, handled the soft ground. And obviously, she's a big engine, usually in soft ground. Uh, it takes more than fitness. It, it's You have to have a big engine. Like, you can have them fit, um, but unless they have a big engine, they won't keep powering through soft ground. And that's what she did on the day. And, and uh, she obviously, uh, we learned that she gets a mile and a half very well. In terms of Jer's analogy about football as well, it is kind of like a minor that was decent, that just physically blossomed. Is it to become a really good senior sort of hurler? Or, um, is there one thing you can put your finger on to explain like how um, she's just become so, so good? It was just, I know she's bred to be a three-year-old, but she's uh, maybe it's middle distances as well, I suppose. Yeah, no, I suppose Jared is, it was a good uh, analysis of it. Uh, like, I suppose like players like Henry Shefflin and those special players and loads of other GA players, they weren't always special on the way up along their 18s and 21s or whatever, but then they just became special. Um, and, and probably because... Um, they just kept developing and, and maybe they, had they been pitched in at the deep end so that um, you, their heart would have been broken to stop the progression. I suppose it's a little bit like that. I suppose the same with humans. The, the ability could be there, but if you don't ever really bottom them um, in, in their runs on the way, uh, they can keep progressing. If you if you throw them in too deep and at the cold face front of, of, of uh, races or, or matches or whatever, you can break their heart and then that stops it, breaks their spirit. But of course, she was a little bit like that last year. She she kept running, she kept going everywhere for experience. She was traveling there and she was amongst the bunch. She wasn't in the front line at any time, but she was gaining a lot of experience and physically and mentally she was probably developing it as she was going along. It sounds like it almost surprised you a little bit, the the, the pace of the development and even, not the potential, I don't want to say that you didn't think the potential was there, but when you were talking about the breeding, it was like, this is, it's almost a little bit unexpected that she was as successful as she was given the breeding. No, she, she was very well bred. So usually what happens, uh, genes will come through if you if you allow it to develop. Um, and usually if they have the physique and, and if they have the ability and if you think that they have the mind to go along, usually if you don't bottom them, they will keep progressing. Like usually those bred horses, they, they keep growing and developing when, when the pedigrees are good. And because that's what uh, the pedigrees uh, say that's going to happen, it's a kind of a roadmap really. So um, I suppose that's what happened. Like we would start off the start of the year with, with a bunch of three-year-olds and like most of them obviously would have the physiques and the pedigrees to be good and like we try not to bang their heads together for leaving them as long as we can before we um before we throw them or put them on the cold for uh, cold face front of the, each battle they can be coming along there but she like we waited a long time with her to run her uh, this year she just got out just before the oaks um in the music door in a race in york we waited as long as we could and she made a run in that day and, and she won very easily and then she went on to Epson and, and then I suppose it's not obviously the rest was history really. I know Aidan you're 25 years and a bit more at this now at this point and the game has changed remarkably the, the, the information and data you have access to now versus what you would have had all those years ago in a situation like that with Snowfall it seems like a lot of his instincts this horse is ready or not ready when you talked about 
um, going too early and, and they, them getting heartbroken. There's no data point to say that the horse has had its heart broken. That's something that you must know instinctively. How do you merge all the information that you have and learned and the, the feel that you have for over the last 25 years and even before that with the cold, hard splits of times and heart rate and all that kind of stuff that you must have? Yeah, no, I, I, it's very uh, true, Jared. All, all We have a lot more information now than we used to have. Like, and, and information is always an advantage. But like, we always think, like, on a daily basis, you have to keep kind of keep observing them and watching them. And uh, and we always say, kind of, you have to see it to feel it. So, like, it's sort of like a, a child or a or a, um, a what would you say, a teenager progressing. Like, you, you just keep watching them develop physically and mentally, and. Uh, I keep helping them and doing things that you can to make them happy and keep them happy and keep them safe and keep them sound. So, um, and then the time comes really uh, for a horse in their classic career. Like, the, like you, you wait as long as you can before you start them or produce them. But then the time comes when they have to run because if they don't run, they're not going to be classic three-year-olds. So we give her all the time, like obviously through last year and uh, obviously as much time as we could give her this year before we said, kind of, listen, now you have to go. And, and obviously when it did go, like she did go and she did take off, went the right way, but that doesn't always happen. But like every horse you have to, like, well, we try and give them a chance, like to, they're, they're bred well enough and they're physically strong enough, big enough looking that they, they have to get a chance. So that, that's really the way. So I give them as, long, as much time as you can to keep changing and swapping things. And then it's like everything that the time usually has to go. Then if they're going to be classic horses, like, if you if you only want them say if they're going to be four year old then obviously you can wait longer but like they're bred and everyone kind of bred trains and rares horses to be classic horses in their of their three year old generation. And is there a, is there a tension between the uh, the the time in which the the races are coming towards you and also the performance level on the clock? Is, is I guess I'm, I'm trying to find out is the, is there a data point where you have. Um, a furlong at home or two furlong or a stretch at home where if, if a horse hits a certain time you're like right ready to go let's get them on the classic pathway yeah, I suppose I suppose with horses there's a sales cause of breed up sales and breeze up sales and kind of they like to see horses be able to do a couple of furlongs in a 10, 10 or, 20, or 20 second furlongs or around that to say that they have speed enough to be good horses but really all horses are different when you like at three, like obviously the distance are further, that, that would be for kind of two-year-olds, kind of five, six, seven furlong races. But as three-year-olds, it's different. Every horse is different. But at, at the same time, those good horses are usually able to hit fair fractions. Like for, they're able to usually do 11 second furlongs for four furlongs in a row. And, and usually when they can do that kind of stuff, they, they have a very high cruising pace. And in those classic races, that's what you have to have. And you have to have that ability to be able to go through that those kind of fractions over those type of furlongs to, to be good really Where would St Mark's Basilica have come in in terms of that data given like just uh, th that turn of foot he seems to have in his races Yeah he was always very high Johnny he, he looked, uh, obviously uh, we spoke before we thought he was a Coventry horse a Heinz horse a group one over six furlongs and uh, like he was showing those type of fractions all the time like so like I suppose for a horse like him to be kind of a, a Coventry Jew horse type of horse to be able to like obviously you would imagine he'd be able to get a mile uh, but then he went down and he was very comfortable at a mile and a quarter as well so that horse has to have real class to do that kind of stuff and and like he he physically looked like a, a real good fast early two-year-old but he had he had scope as well but obviously then when we stretched him out to a mile and a quarter he found that easy as well so that that usually means that there's an awful lot of class there we we were just talking about this before the show that um, Ireland isn't traditionally a hotbed for sprinters in general, um, and like we've had the likes of Eddie Lynham and so on would have had some very good sprinters in recent years, really top sprinters. It's, it's you don't get that many top sprinters like um, and maybe things will change in the years to come with different stallions or whatever. But if you if you get a if you got a world class sprinter, how do you train him or her differently to Snowfall, for example, or is there much in it? Uh, yeah, there's not not an awful lot. Obviously, their works, their strong works would be shorter, like because you wouldn't be trying, you wouldn't want to extend them too much because usually those fast horses don't want to be extended. And if you did extend them, like you would drag them, and they'd probably have too uh, tough a works, and and they'd probably eat into their reserves too much. So you always try to keep them short, uh, keep them fast, and keep them strong. Like I, I suppose, like obviously, it's like it's the very same as human beings that the sprinters train different than the 
then the middle distance people are the thousand meter, two thousand or four thousand, whatever, you know. So it's all, all little tweaks. Um but like really they have to have the physique and like to go those distance you have to have the capacity first. But it's unusual that uh, you, you get one that can like kind of go short distances and go mm. the kind of middle distances, if you know what I mean. Would you would you like the challenge of of, of training like a, a seriously, seriously good sprinter who can kind of turn it on for a few years? You know, absolutely. But I, I suppose our thing is a little bit different. Like horses for us have to like we're always trying to find the stallions and and mm. they and they have to kind of do it at two and three. That's what commercial breeders want. Like everyone wants a horse that's going to mature early, have speed, and uh, and then be able to compete at the top in in classic level. The, the, it's, I suppose it's a little bit different when you go to a horse kind of being good at four or five. Uh, they're kind of nearly heading on to kind of jumping stallions, if you know what I mean, unless something happened to them at two and three. But like, I suppose it's just the way it is. And it's uh, everybody wants the horse that's going to mature early, be fast and, and have class all at the one go, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, that I suppose that's the pressure, isn't it, to continue producing those at the level that you haven't produced them. We haven't um, spoken to you since uh, Galileo in the summer, and, and uh, now having seen the the way that it essentially become one of the most dominant stallions in history, and the quality is going to be there for generation after generation after generation. It kind of it's a an almost a sto- an immortal story now at this point. What what's your reflection on that career and the influence Galileo had in your career as well? like obviously um he always came he came to us with a massive reputation he had that as a full yearling two-year-old three-year-old all the way along and then when he went to stud like it developed as well so like he's been u- unique horse really like he has a great pedigree he's obviously by a saddler's wells and but i suppose what made him different than every other horse was the mental trait that he put into all his uh, stock uh, he was unbelievably genuine um always wanted to please never said no no matter what like you could be with Galileo and a lot of his stock, you can be hard on them every day and they'll still come out the next morning and they'll say to you, what do you want me to do today? Where most horses, like horses are very intelligent, uh, turbos are very intelligent. And if you push them too hard someday, they might come out the next day and say, listen, I'm not going to try as hard today or um, like I'm sick of this or whatever. But what makes Galileo different is they turn out every morning and they'll they'll die on the ground for you, no matter what, no questions asked. And, and uh, they'll never... They'll never look sideways at you to say, "Why did you do that to me?" or "Why did you do this?" or whatever. They're just incredibly genuine, and it's it's a a trait that like we've never ever seen in in any in any horse before, really. Yeah, and uh, this I was only thinking of this recently. Apart from Frankel, who's an obvious example, Aidan, they were very very rarely keen in their races. Like if you look at Galileo's, they they nearly seem to run to a very similar A, B, and C. As you as you mentioned, that toughness. Um, very versatile regarding trips. It, it, it must be said, albeit, you know, you'd expect them to be 10 furlong horses, maybe that, but rarely, rarely like fighting with the rider. And it's, the, I suppose it's one of the worst things as a trainer to try to deal with. And as a jockey, if you're still keen two or three runs in, where are you going? Yeah, no, I suppose, like, obviously, uh, uh, when like when you're training a horse or anybody training a person, you always want to, uh, like, everything has to relax and, and, and breathe and do things properly. And if that all happens, then you have a better chance of finding more at the end of the race. Um, I suppose that's that's the way like the, you, you bring them along and like everything has to be relaxed and it's like yourself if you're going along and you're tense uh, you, you won't finish as well as if you were going along and you're relaxed if, if, if you know what I mean How long will it take for you guys to realise one way or another whether or not St Mark's Basilica is a, a natural successor to Galileo and, and maybe that's unfair because Galileo has been so spectacularly like you, you've mentioned Galileo in the same breath as Sadler's Wells they're again a, a legendary iconic and it's like no, no coincidence that it's from the same bloodline so how, how soon will we know if the offspring of St Mark's Basilica are going to live up to the, the billing essentially you know, I suppose what makes this horse very exciting for us is that he always worked like a real good top horse and, and he has all the pure uh, traits that Galileo had. If you see him, he runs with his head out and down and uh, stretches. And what, what makes him different is that he has this great turn of, of toe. He's, he's a, an unbelievable acceleration. And that's why when we ran him, we never ran him with any other horses. So like we were always very confident that if, if they stood still, he'd go backwards in a race. If they walked, he, he, he'd stand. You know, So he was always happy just to relax, folly horses. And we were always very confident, no matter what horses did in front of him or how much they quickened, that he would pick them up. And um, Because he has that, that very, very unusual turn of toe and, and then that 
pure genuineness of, of Galileo to, to finish it off. So he's, he's a perfect cross, really, of, of Galileo and, and Sayuni. So like, we think that that's going to make him like extremely exciting. And like, Andy was very, very good two-year-old. So, um, listen, we, we, listen, we're really excited about him, really. Was the turn of toe evident the first time you saw him? Was yeah, from the time he worked, he, he always had a great, a great turn of toe. He was a little bit green and babyish as a two year old. And because it was the COVID year, the races all were packing up on top of each other, and we couldn't give him too much time to uh to to uh, get over from race to race because he had he could he had to he had kind of had to meet the markers if he was going to be a good uh, two year old. And, and we thought that he was going to be a very good two year old, and we didn't know what was going to happen at three. But as as it came out, we were kind of pushing him into slots through the whole two-year-old year that that he wasn't really ready for it but at the end he caught up himself and and uh, even though we weren't giving him time to catch up he caught up and won the won the Jew horse and then obviously when we started him uh, when we started him the start of the year then he just like we, we thought he was very good at two but then when he started at three it just became very apparent very quick that he was very special and when that happens is that the type of stuff that gets you excited and there's kind of a, just a free song of excitement that goes through the whole operation because everybody realises ooh we've got something special here because you've seen all the great horses and I, I often wonder when you've no other worlds to conquer what is it that keeps you going and keeps you excited yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly, Joe. Like, like when he ran in the French Guineas and the, the English Guineas winner and all that was there, like that was his first run of the year. And like he dealt with them, like three of them all with total contempt. You know, he, he he relaxed and in soft ground and he quickened and just left them for dead and won very snug. But like then straight away we knew, listen, this horse is very special. And then obviously he went on and the, the French Derby is a very difficult race to win and he did the very same thing. And then he went from there on to the... E tips and, and he met probably two of the best older horses that were around and um, very exposed horses. Like he was a, a baby three year old going in, going in against them. It was a slow run race. The the, the two older horses were in, in in pole position in front of him and uh, they quickened and got three or four lengths on him in the straight. So usually if that happens off a slow run race and horses at that caliber, you can't pick them up, but he picked them up and beat them very snug, like like well before the furlough mark or the race was over and it's not all those things like only special horses do that kind of stuff really just, just just from the outside looking in I suppose it's the one thing that people would disappoint with in the flat that we've seen Sir Marks with Silica but we've only really seen him for uh, you know 18 months or whatever now he's retired and I guess it's disappointing that for fans you don't see him sort of go on to, as a 4 or 5 year old is, is, is there more of a pressure now that Galileo has passed to bring in a new stallion or what was the thinking I guess behind his retirement you know, I suppose absolutely, but Johnny, I suppose for those horses, they, like they have to do with that two and three, and and that's what the breeders want. And I, I suppose it was pressure uh, in Cool more from the breeders that he kind of had to retire. Mm. Like obviously, like you could wait another year, but you weren't being fair to him. Like everything he was doing was uh, to uh, to be uh, expose him to go to stud, and and obviously the minute he became special, like then listen, the, the clock was taken. Really, he he was going to have to go to stud as a three-year-old and like obviously um we were very lucky like what happened in going to york could have finished them all together and and like obviously he went to leperstown probably with with like like with, like carrying that you know so like we were very lucky to see him like and to come back and do it in ireland for us like i suppose is really yeah. where we wanted it to happen really you know uh, so yeah. I, I suppose it was just too important to keep going uh, uh johnny really and 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 finally any anton for the the weekend including paris for um the friday night racing listeners i know you'll have plenty of good runners and it's going to be a brilliant weekend yeah no i suppose sure we have like, a nice two-year-old running uh in um uh, tomorrow and uh um, no, sure. Then I, I suppose then after that we're, we're on to France and, and sure, hopefully the horses run well there, really. Um, but as Seamus rides a nice two-year-old uh, uh, tomorrow. Well, listen, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that. The off-season is, is almost upon us. What do you do for downtime? How do you enjoy yourself and relax and recharge the batteries for next season? Oh, no, really what we usually do is uh, we go to the Breeders' Cup uh, for the week and uh, we usually go to Barbados for two weeks after that and uh, then we come back and, and then we're, we're, we're working then after that uh, to kind of next season starts then again after that Well enjoy the break it's brilliant having you on again Aidan thanks a million for joining us cheers Pleasure Jared. Thanks a million It's uh, Aidan O'Brien one of the, the great minds in Irish sport giving the, us some insight into what the operation is like Something he said there like that was a fairly um, 
fairly lengthy interview and I, I know a lot of people be looking for this two year old um, that's running tomorrow um, who's I think he's called Sun King I actually I did the race the racing post and it's, it's funny because I, I, I actually put up a horse that Joseph trains against him who's by Churchill who ran a really nice race called Comfort Zone first him out but I mean that would be a bit of a bit of a negative when Aidan is kind of put, picking down his horse again but just in terms of the depth of that interview he, he said at the end we nearly lost him there like so he when he got injured in that race that he was talking about and then he was off for was he off for like 10 weeks or something like that so like this St. Mark's Basilica is now retired as he calls one of his you know the best horses just to emphasise the fragility of it just could have died a few months ago you know Um, and then he talks about the pressure that the stud is putting on the training regime to turn him into a stallion and the reason he becomes a stallion is to breed other racehorses but he himself as a racehorse is only racing until he's three and that's kind of the flat game in a in a nutshell in some respects even though it, it, it's kind of maddening because like he's just he is a he may not be the best horse I've ever trained he may be the best horse I've ever trained but we won't really know per se because he didn't dance as many dances as you'd like as in he didn't go to war as a four year old but that's the nature of the flat game and that's why a lot of I think jumps fans will never really warm to it like they would jumps I love the the bit where it's um, snowfall emerges over the course of the season and while the breeding was always there you don't know when it's going to emerge mm. it's kind of like um, the gold prospectors and there's loads of the fool's gold in the middle of it and then the one nugget comes and you have to just keep keep going and keep going and keep going and find it there and uh, that's the bit where the art and the science mix and it's just fascinating like you know you've got they're literally the greatest trainer um in the world doing what he's doing explaining yeah I, I do use the science absolutely but then talking about a horse having its heart broken yeah it, the horse isn't telling you it has its heart bro- it, its heart's broken obviously it performs like that after a period of time and you're like okay well that was I can retrospectively like Ralph Wiggum precisely identify the moment his heart's heart breaking here ripped in half yeah it's <laughs> a great episode um, but he's he's very reliant on his staff there you know he's uh, how do you how can you I'm actually amazed that he can just name every horse one by one when he looks at them particularly when they look so alike a lot of them they're by the same daddy um, and he can just reel them off but it's the work riders like are so important it's an incredibly good team of work riders he mentioned Seamus Heffernan there um, who would be such an important part but what was interesting in the in the year that Galileo passed away, because Galileo's influence on the stock is just is 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 genuinely unbelievable, and as and, is, and kind of eternal. That is, it, the point. it's eternal. Yeah. It's because it's the same way Sad as Wells is a northern dancer, and so on and so forth. So like as 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 you go back, and then maybe you go back to the the, the three stallions who basically shaped the thoroughbred and the such, you know, the Arab breeding there, and so on and so forth. But in the modern age, um, like. You know they've experimented with other stallions that haven't worked out. Like Galileo, he wasn't the best racehorse ever, or whatever. Like he was a really good racehorse, but it's just that toughness that you can rely on his stock. Well, that's mad. Yeah, and that'll bring you to the line. Why? Why does all the other Sadler's Wells horses not have that? No, it's not that they don't. And in fairness, to well, the, they don't have it to the same degree. They they don't have the they just they, like they. I don't I don't really know because Sadler's Wells had other horses like, for example, Monju, who wasn't like that. He was he was quirky. Um, wasn't that he was he he, he was genuine, but he he had his king a lot of his horses like if you if you're breeding horses that are keen that's a massive massive negative because it's it is a difference to the human at the end of the day like the you are there is a kind of a hierarchy here where the horse wants to run for the human master and i know that sounds a bit kind of harsh but it's it's sort of true like so if the horse defers to you like the pet that you love if you don't necessarily love your pet if your pet um is trying to you know get one over you whereas if your pet kind of wants to serve you and be good horses that do that are better than horses that start fighting and that if, if you can't teach them to settle and you can't let them drop the bit whether it's nervous anxiety or whether it's just the fact that they're headstrong they're never going to reach their potential and Galileo horses apart from Frankel really it's very very hard to think off the top of my head of very good horses um, but the, the, the point I was meandering towards was that we spoke about four horses really of Aidan O'Brien's that are extremely topical at the moment. St. Mark's Basilica, who's retired. Snowfall, who's favourite or second favourite for the Ark. Um, Luxembourg, who's now favourite for the Derby, who, run, who ran uh, last weekend. And Tenebrism, 
who came back and won the Phillies uh, Group 1. None of them was by Galileo, and that's really, really weird. There are four different stallions, Sayuni, um, Caravaggio, uh, Deep Impact, and uh, Camelot in the shape of Luxembourg, who looks... And this is the beauty of racing, that St. Mark Stilica is retired, and Luxembourg, who's by Camelot... He is absolutely stunning to look at. And the way he won um, the Beresford at the weekend was amazing. And then on the Tuesday, I think, his full brother uh, was sold as a yearling for 1.1 million or whatever it was. But the clock keeps... Con- the clock just the, the circle just keeps going. I don't know if you remember the, the magic eye thing that was popular in the 90s. It was yeah. You had to stare at it for a while. Yeah. Sometimes it strikes me that um, flat racing is a bit like that. If you can tune in properly to the great tectonic plates of the the old houses that are up against each other in these big races then all of a sudden there's this incredibly rich tapestry to horses that we see shimmer across mm. for an 18 month period it's not actually 18 months it's a, it's a generation it, and it's the previous generation and before that and it's the breeding of it yeah, and it's and the, it goes on and on and on and uh, if that comes into relief if you can see that if you just yeah. for long enough you're like ah this is the great house of you know. But it'll still make it'll still make a fool of you because like Galileo was not doing well when Jim Bulger started investing in him. In his first year, Galileo wasn't doing well, and his stallion fee dropped, I think, to thirty-seven and a half grand. It'd be massive. We might be able to uh, get a get collection Mark's going. Basil- well, say St. Mark's Basilica. I How know much he, Aiden said he was precocious. I mean, I, I'm guessing he'll be like eighty, hundred grand or something like that because he's not. It doesn't matter how good he is, he's not proven as a stallion. And mm. maybe he'll be more than that. Frankel, Frankel was more than that, but like you couldn't say he's Frankel. Um, so, me, like, it's not certain that his horses will make two-year-olds. Like Galileo horses, he might say they're precocious, but generally they're they're three-year-olds. Aiden's Aiden trains these Galileos that to 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 improve with time. They rarely win maidens earlier in the season, so they're they're not like. But that's not necessarily the horse you want. But say Mark's Basilica horses might want time, and then in his first season, if they're like, there's so much expectation about Churchill, for example, and if they're not an immediate success, doubts start to creep in. I'll oh, say Mark's Basilica, this or that, and. It then then the guy who goes to the sales and just says, "Listen, it's like the good the good the good guy on the stock market. He goes against the crowd and he says, listen, that's all waffle.' To be honest, like give them time. Yeah. I'm willing to play the longer game. And like Jim Bulger, I'm now getting Galileo um, at a third off what he was. And now Galileo was what he will be. and then he, Galileo was ended up in essentially on like private or half a million. But at that time he was thirty seven grand. So you have to say, well, I'm going to. And the guy who goes to the sales and he sees this horse and the stallion isn't popular, but he looks at that horse and he says, I just love the way that horse walks. I love his head. I love everything about him. And this is the best thing ever. I'm getting him for like twenty percent of his price because his daddy's not that popular at the moment. I'm willing to forgive him. That in that's the beauty of the game, and that they're completely different opinions. And just like stocks and shares, if everyone says like buy air come shares, you probably shouldn't. Yeah, or if the shoeshine boy is in that story. Uh, <laughs> so if you want to get in touch, you can leave a comment in the YouTube stream. You can text the show this evening on five three one six. This is Friday Night Racing, brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. As I said earlier on, we had. Um, Frankie Dettori on the show last week he was in excellent form and he seemed to be in excellent form from all the photographs and video that I saw from Value Sound on Thursday Johnny we sat here last week we interviewed him and then we were like he's definitely going to win that race isn't he I didn't back him did you back him uh, no, and he and, wasn't. He and, wasn't on back. Well, it went to post a four to one. No, I think. it went off nine to two. Um, but I, it, it was truly remarkable. Like, and he was always going to win. It was fated, written in the stars. If ever there was a sure thing, here we are after timing horribly. Like, yeah, but in, in fairness, without the after time, like you could definitely back the horse. It, it had solid form in the book. But what what struck me was. Um, the cult of personality around Frankie de Tory was staggering. There was a cult of personality around Barney Curley in which like a lot of people genuinely wanted to get a photo in the phone box in which the Yellow Sam story was so central in that phone box. Ended up meeting relatives of his um of Barney Curley's relatives of the guy in the phone box. It was a great day out. But Frankie de Tory and it made me think, because I, I don't know Frankie that well. I've sometimes gotten the impression that he's not the warmest personality. And I think he kind of puts on a bit of a show in front of the cameras. And I was looking at him yesterday and I was saying, I don't know how he does it. I honestly have no idea how he does it. You have Ryan Moore on one end who basically says bugger all and is just like, oh, I just want to ride the horses, leave me alone. And then you have Frankie who, he must have posed for 2,000 selfies yesterday. He was in a small Irish racetrack to ride a horse in a run-of-the-mill race. He was there in a day trip. 
it was incessant. It was absolutely incessant. And to they were my there to see him. They were there to see him. And to my mind, um, he basically stopped um, for for every photograph. So if if there have been some occasions in the past where he was less than uh, effusive in every single moment, I bet you that got reported. Oh, he, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. How um, easy it is for that, like. There's all yeah. There's always sort of a story behind it, like, and uh, I, I, in, he's he has he had the ex appeal, and in fairness, to him to win in the race, it was it was quite special. And you are, I'm not a spiritual person, um, and not I don't believe in God, but you are thinking, well, Barney's kind of looking down this year, you know. It was cool. It was really cool, and he lit the place up. The atmosphere good. Yeah, it was, and uh, like I have been, I have to be honest, I haven't been racing in a year uh, since Listowel last year. I hadn't been racing, so it was over twelve months. And funnily enough, people said to me yesterday in the in the press room, he said, this was the first day since the start of COVID that it felt like we're kind of coming back. We just need Frankie Dettori to have a winner for Barney Curley every day of the week. Well, brand, I, kind of. Do you know the whole thing about everybody's scared, people are getting out of the habit of doing the things that they used to do, and so you're going to mm. have to relearn those things. I think we're going to slip back into doing the things that we wanted to do and did before, mm. and we'll get back to match going, and we'll get back to pints beforehand and arguments afterwards, because that's kind of the sports culture that we have yeah I, I, I agree but I do think racing is a challenge because um, you know it's it's a world where people are coming out of Covid in some respects more addicted to their phones than ever probably worse attention span than ever and the, the key for racing is to sell it as a day long entertainment when you know much of the time only nine, like 5-10% of the actual day is taken up by the sport there's so much stuff in between that you have to sell that and it's not it's not necessarily that easy that's why we have shows like this where we, we, we want to promote the sport but a day at the races um, in 2021 is not a day at the races in 1981 or 1975 when Yellow Sam won it's a different yeah. it's a different world now and we have to sell that and make it easier um, to sell and that's the challenge that, that racing will face going forward Search for a song added 18 points for Johnny in the tote 10 to follow last weekend stretching his lead over me to 31 points Will the big uh, Pridlark favourite Tarnawa do the business for you? You've got Tarnawa right and extend your lead even further on Sunday or will it be snowfall for both of us to maintain the status quo? Have I a chance of catching um uh, Tom? What's there's 330A, 412? I don't think so. Probably not. Um, so now was a good chance, yeah. Dermot Well was talking up the um, Japanese horse whose name escapes me during the week. Did this an interesting point just in terms of the tote because there'll be a lot of Far Eastern money put into the pool. So if you're having a bet with the tote, by all means do. Um, and back back essentially back an Irish or British horse whatever your fancy is because it'll probably be a skewed market. Um, the Japanese betters seem to be patriotic betters, which is great as long as you're not backing what they are, um, and that'll make. I mean, it's 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 conceivable something like, I think Snowfall has a great chance she could go off seven to one conceivably. Like, do you know what I mean? A reminder: the tote jackpot is available on all Irish race meetings. You can play the tote jackpot on all races and on tote.ie. Right? Is there anything else that we need to talk about? Did you find? Sorry, you did find the name of that two-year-old. Uh, I think it's Sun King. Uh, he was a horse by Galileo. Uh, who he would have run first time out in Galway Sun King yeah um, first time out in Galway it was a good run now Fiuk McHugh is in the race does that ring a bell to you a bit of history buffs Planksty song alright go on follow me up to Carlo I mean I know that follow me up to Carlo punchline Fiuk McHugh was um, was one of the the warriors uh, who would have won one of those wars in what this is sort of the 17th century is one of the rare Irish in, wins over the English Glen Malore. Um, Red Hugh and all the Flight of the Earls that generation yeah give or take so yeah 17th century so um, a lot of the battles obviously like that was I don't know was that the Nine Years War or whatever it was but basically the Irish lost most of them but Fiuk McHugh was one of the leaders who won one of the wars and Follow Me Up to Carlo was reportedly written on the spot of the of the battle afterwards um, by and then has been sung by Christy Moore and so on and so forth but um, yeah it was Fiuk McHugh probably going to fall short unfortunately in this battle uh, I came up with comfort zone but by the sounds of Aiden like from to mention the one horse all weekend he's snowfall <laughs> he's all these like I really do up against you I really do fancy comfort Aiden against Johnny Ward there's only one winner there stick sorry your, Aiden stick your neck out go on yeah, yeah, yeah in yeah. fairness comfort zone like it's it's um, it's, if it's going to be an each way price it, it runs such a good race at the car I love the pedigree and Churchill is a son of Galileo of which there are high hopes as well he's, he gets beautiful horses but they got a 
they've got to walk the walk as well yeah. All right, well, should we know it takes a little bit of time for that to happen. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball is brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie and we will see you next week. Cheers. Friday Night Racing on Off the Ball. Brought to you by Horse Racing Ireland. Love every racing moment. Visit hri.ie.